All right, now for this to, for this uh, lecture, we're going to continue talking about this process of converting raw scores into z-scores and finding probabilities and areas in the normal distribution. We're going to start out in this lecture talking about why probability equals area in continuing distribution. So you need to understand how the area under the curve of a, of a density distribution <clears throat> is the same as, or can be interpreted as, the proportion or the percentile or the probability of a certain range of values in that distribution. <coughs> so, remembering uh, why we love z-scores so much, they help us find probabilities in the normal distribution, which we use to approximate probabilities in real-world data. So the area under any density curve, uh, first of all, we define that as one. We define it as one just kind of by common agreement. Once you've got one of those theoretical density curves, like normal distribution, for instance, you just say all the area under that curve, even though it extends to infinity on the right and infinity on the left, kind of a paradox, it keeps getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier to the right and skinnier to the left to infinity, but you can say the total area is one or 100%. The total area under the curve is one. And then if you divide that area up in any way, you have a proportion of area. And then if you are applying this distribution, kind of overlaying it on top of a real distribution of values, you can say the proportion of area, let's say 25% of the area or 0.25 of the area, that's the same as the proportion of the total number of observations represented by that distribution. 25% so of the area is 25% of the observations. And that assumes that the curve kind of represents a histogram. But why do we care about this area so much? of probabilities because areas are probabilities so for instance we we ask this question this p-value question if the null hypothesis were true what would the probability be of observing these data or even more extreme there's that probability so we can use the normal distribution curve to approximate that probability and we can approximate p which is that area and we can approximate alpha, which is another area, which isn't in that little, little statement or question right there. But alpha is, a, is an area like that. Now, we do this all the time. We think that area equals n. In fact, we, we uh, construct... Sorry, I need to make sure I'm still recording. Well, yeah, I am. We construct our graphs frequently based on this idea that area corresponds to proportion of observation. So here's some data from punishment attitudes data set which you'll probably end up playing with later this semester you've got everything divided up by males versus females and whether they said they were centrist liberal very liberal conservative or very conservative in this study and this is a mosaic plot so you can see the proportions a mosaic plot by definition it creates itself the computer creates it so that the area the square inches or centimeters of each thing is proportional to the number of participants in the study so this right here says liberal female 0.17 that means this is 17 percent if this is you know like 32 square inches or something then this is 17 percent of those 32 square inches and it also means that female liberals are 17 percent of the entire data set right so area equals proportion and proportion equals probability this way this specific way if we randomly selected one person from this study what's the probability that it would be let's see a conservative female the area is 0.08 in this graph and if the proportion of conservative females is 0.08 in the study then the probability of randomly selecting a conservative female is 0.08 so area proportion probability these are the same thing as long as you link them together this way another example pie charts we do this all the time uh, statisticians don't like them I don't have a big problem with them they don't they're not always the best choice but uh, if you were to randomly sample one case from this data set, what's the probability of selecting a married person? It's 61.2%. Because the proportion of observations is probability if you frame the probability question this way. If I were to randomly sample one case from this data set, what's the probability of selecting a divorced person? 8.9%. A widowed person? 7.3%. There's a horse that's being beaten. So you can do this with numerical data as well, but with numerical data, we talk about ranges of data. I'm trying to remember what this value, oh, these are ACT scores. All right, I'm good, I wrote, I'm glad I wrote that down here. So ACT scores of university students at the university I used to work at. I had some data from uh, a sample there. What if you were to randomly select one student, what's the probability that 
you would select a student with a math with an ACT math score that was less than or equal to a score of 16. What is that probability? The probability is all the probabilities, all the area of the graph to the left of the point of 16. Turns out it's 14.58% of observation, so the probability would be 0.146, about 15%. So the area of the graph is the proportion of observations, and the proportion of observations is a probability. When you ask this specific question, what is the probability of randomly selecting one case or one observation from this data set? So we think about that question quite a lot. That's the question that's involved in calculating p-values and in thinking about alpha. So this works with density distributions because density functions, they don't have individual observations. They're all infinite and perfectly thin bars and stuff like that, but they have area, have ranges of area under the curve. That's a clever name. We can divide that area into pieces and those pieces represent proportions of observations if this density curve were like a histogram and if this was a distribution of real data. But it actually doesn't matter that it's not because we're using a theoretical something to pretend. And pretending is okay sometimes. So we're missing still one tool. We know how to calculate z-scores and we know that we want to find areas in the normal distribution and we're going to pretend like the normal distribution is real data somehow because our real data is kind of normal, but we don't know how to figure out those probabilities. So the tool that we're missing here is the thingy that gives us areas, that gives us areas in the normal curve, in the, in the normal distribution curve, gives us areas under the curve. We don't know how to get that. And the way we get that is using z-scores. Z-scores are the intermediate step that's getting that area. So any z-score on the x-axis, uh, on the number line, any number line, any real or imaginary value of x, it's a dividing point for the distribution. It divides it vertically. It's a histogram, so you can only divide it vertically. You can't divide it horizontally or diagonally. It doesn't make any sense. So you can say that a z-score of 0 divides any normal distribution into 50-50 pieces. So 50% on one side, 50% on the other side of the distribution. And that's my cat. I really love that cat. I technically love that cat. Uh, you could find just exactly the right z-score here to figure out where 25% uh, of the distribution is below that z-score. So if you if you could find the right z-score, you would be able to put that there and divide the lowest 25% of the area in a distribution. You could find two z-scores, probably a small positive and a small negative number, would give you the center 10% of the area. Anything is possible here. What we frequently like to do, confidence intervals, is find the center 95% of an area. Notice that those z-scores are very close to 2 and negative 2. Actually 1.96 and negative 1.96, but sometimes we just don't have our numbers handy, we could say it's almost two. There you go. We can just use those same z-scores, but look at the area outside them, and now we've got 5% um, of the distribution equally distributed in each tail of the distribution. Those are the two tails. There's two tails there. So if we want to find the upper 5% of the area, we can say that we, we know that a z-score of 1.65 will give us the upper percent of the area. The area above 1.65, the area of all values above 1.65 is the upper 5%. The area below negative 1.65 is the lower 5% because this is perfectly symmetrical. Plus 1.65 minus 1.65. Center 99% of the area, another thing we care about for confidence intervals where we want a 99% confidence interval, turns out you have to use some z-scores of 2.33 and negative 2.33. The outer 1%, same idea. You just flip and say, I'm interested in the outer tails instead of the area between those two z-scores. So any, we're just dividing up the area here. Lower 1.1%, 1 .1%, oh, that's wrong. That's, uh, I made a mistake here. Okay, I'm gonna pretend I didn't make a mistake. Later in the semester, somebody can figure out what mistake I made here and come tell me and I'll buy you a donut. Anyway, um, only if you're the first person who tells me. So plus or minus one, z-score 
it's always 68% more or less of the distribution. If you start from the mean and measure one z-score up and down, and those are your dividing points, then the area you've just defined is 68% of the distribution. And it always looks like those vertical lines are spreading apart as they go up. I think it's an optical illusion because of the curve. Plus or minus two de um, standard deviations always gives you, if, if those are your dividing lines, that always gives you about 95%. As we've seen, exactly 95%, you need 1.96, not two. But it's pretty close. And three gives you about 99.7%. There's one reason why we don't draw uh, normal curves very often. They have z-scores greater than three or four on each side. So normalness is fine. It's easy to divide the distribution. It's easy to draw lines on the number line, wherever your x value or your z value goes. But how do we find the proportions, the proportion of the area that's greater than our x value or less than our x value? Well, that's why we use z-scores, because there's a trick with a normal distribution. Because with a normal distribution, any area can be found, mathematically just working through the formula, as long as the dividing point is expressed as the number of standard deviations that that point is away from the mean of the normal distribution. So let me reiterate that. As long as you express any value in a normal distribution as a z-score, then mathematically, you're guaranteed, as long as you work through all the funky math, to figure out what the area is above that score or below that score or between two dividing scores or anything like that. It's just guaranteed. It's mathematically determined at that point. There's no uncertainty whatsoever. But only if you express things in terms of standard deviations away from the mean of that normal distribution. So how do we find those proportions? Well, technically, you need the formula. You need the normal distribution density formula. Uh, however, we don't generally do that. We do something else. We use the easy stuff. We use tables and software. So if you know z-score for a particular value, and you know how to turn any value into a z-score now, right? You can just take that z-score formula, turn your x value into a z-score, and if somebody tells you the distribution is normal, that's the only way this works, then you take that z-score and you plug it into the table in the back of your textbook, or you plug it into a function uh, in some software, and automatically then you get the normal curve area below that score. That's the usual thing. Some software gives you above the score or between the mean and the score, but our software and our table both give you the normal curve area, the area under the normal curve that is that corresponds to any score below that score, as long as you gave it a z-score. So just a reminder what z-scores are doing, but now applied to normal distributions, they convert the scale of any raw distribution, of any raw score variable. So you can express your variable in raw scores. So these are GRE scores, say, and that's the scale of the variable with a 500 in the middle and 100 standard deviations. So 500 to 600 is a standard deviation, etc. Or you can measure it in standard deviations. Now this is this distribution converted into what we call the standard normal, which I'll talk about in a second. So you can look at standard devi deviations. Where the 500 was before, we have a 0. Where the 600 was before, we have a plus 1. Where the 400 was, we have a minus 1. So we can count this whole distribution off in terms of standard deviations away from the mean. And so this is just scaling. It's just conversion. So values from any distribution can be um, expressed as raw scores or expressed as z-scores, which we sometimes say are standardized scores. And it's just a matter of converting to a different format. In fact, the formula even looks like the formula for converting between like pounds and kilograms or centimeters and inches. It's just a, a linear conversion formula. It's the same thing. It's just converting between uh, raw scores and z scores. It's like time zones. It's like money. There are always two different number scales existing there potentially. One of them is the raw score scale and the other one is the z score scale. And any number on the z score can be z score scale could be turned into the raw score scale if you apply one of those z score formulas. And any number that's expressed in raw scores can be turned into a z score if you apply the other of those z score formulas. So we like converting things to z-scores because all z-scores can be compared with each other. That's why we call them standard scores. Everything can be compared with everything if you convert it into a z-score first. Whether that compar comparison makes sense is a different situation. Now, I'm probably beating a dead horse again, but I do want to emphasize this scaling business. So here's a unit normal distribution, and I'm showing you the z-scores here plus one, plus two, plus three. We're not showing much of the distribution, but this is about what we usually show. 
from about minus three standard deviations up to about plus three standard deviations. And the raw scores, the Xs, let's say it's a distribution of temperature and we know that it's normally distributed with a mean of 48 degrees and a standard deviation of seven. Well, then that's what it would look like. The mean of 48 and then you're jumping in steps of seven degrees as you go up the scale and down in seven degrees as you go down the scale. IQ is generally in the population uh, they, they mess with the test so that it's convenient to work with the numbers and they'll work it out so that the mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. And so that's how IQ scores are distributed there. It's very easy to figure out what percentage of the population should have an IQ above like a third, 130. A very small percentage actually. ACT math scores tend to be, these achievement and ability scores tend to be pretty normally distributed. Percent of waste recycled in Toronto by citizens in 2005. I don't know, I made this up. Body mass index, I found this from some online data. There's a particular sample of people who have a BMI distributed this way and it's fairly normally. So you see, all you need to know is the mean and the standard deviation and you need to know that the distribution is normal for us to apply this normal business. But you can convert anything into z-scores, normal or not. Let's say this is GPA of psych students. Now this demonstrates an interesting piece. We end up with a GPA here of 4.05, and if we win another standard deviation, it would be even higher. You could go down until it made no sense, until you had negative uh, GPAs. And that's because the normal curve is a theoretical thing that goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, so we have to remember to be rational when we apply it to our real data. So what we're kind of doing here is I'm showing, how, we're showing you how we apply this to our real data. We say our real data are more or less normally distributed, so this is what we're going to do with it. We're going to say these are the z-scores, and this is kind of how they correspond to the normal distribution. But real data always have an actual maximum value that you can't go beyond and an actual minimum value that you can't go below. Well, they usually do. And so the normal distribution, in many ways, doesn't perfectly approximate reality. Now. We're to the standard normal distribution, and the standard normal distribution is any normal distribution with all the x values, the raw values, converted to z-scores. And that's what we're doing every time we convert a raw score to a z-score. We're basically translating between our specific normal distribution that has a specific mean and standard deviation and the unit or standard normal distribution. It always has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. The z-scores always have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one because you're measuring in z-scores from the, or in standard deviations from the mean, so that always happens. So if you measure in standard deviations, the proportions are always the same. So the proportions look like this. If you measure a plus and minus one standard deviation, you have 68.27% of the area between these two things, just 15.73% out here, 15.73% out here. Uh, if you want to find the middle 50%, then you have to find a z-score of negative 0 0.6745 and positive 0 0.6745. Uh, if you want to find that middle 50% and then going beyond that, get this outer area. If you want to find that outer area is usually um, where we end the tails on a box plot. We end them at Q1 minus 1.5 IQRs and Q3 plus, you don't need to know this, but this is how we decide to end the the um, whiskers and start putting dots for outlier data. So finding the middle 50% and finding the quartiles and ends of the box and whisker plots, this is how that always matches up. Normal box plot always looks like this, always has these proportions. So the proportions under the curve are always the same if you're measuring in standard deviation. It's always like this. We talk about the 68, 95, and 99, 7 rule, which you're textbook mentions, and you might as well memorize it, it's a good idea. It can help you make some decisions on tests and things. Between plus and minus one standard deviation on either side of the mean, you have 68% of the data. I actually saw it's 68 point something. Plus and minus two, we have almost 95%, of, oh, actually slightly more than 95% of the data. Plus and minus three standard deviations, this whole area here, we have 99.7% of the data. It's always the case. The normal distribution is always like this. If we apply that to a real situation with a real mean and a real standard deviation, 111 in this particular sample standard deviation, and the mean in this particular situation was 504, and we can figure out what plus and, one, plus and minus one standard deviation would be here, and we can figure out 68% of observations in this data, data set should be between 393 and 615. If we wanted to find out where 95% of the data should fall, 
it would be between 282 and 726. As long as our data really fit that normal distribution, and we might find that they don't fit perfectly, because they never do. So, the normal distribution in theory, standard normal distribution, is always the same thing. But the relationship between the raw scores and the z-scores is what changes. Sometimes a raw score is a z-score of 25, which is crazy. Sometimes a raw score is a z-score of negative 1.3. Uh, and it just depends on the particular mean and standard deviation of your particular data set. But if you convert everything back to z-scores, then the mean is always 0 and the standard deviation is always 1. And the middle 68% is always between minus 1 and plus 1 um, scores. So you could just think of it that changing the standard deviation and changing the mean. We're just shifting that normal curve left and right on the on the number line and squishing it. Now I use my amazing Photoshop skills to squish. So you notice that the number line stays the same here, but what if we just got a sample of individuals or a population of individuals who all did extremely consistently on this test that has a mean of 650? So it still has a mean of 650, but now everybody's piled in the middle. And now the 68% of the data is between maybe 625 and 670 or something like that. Whereas here, middle 68 is between 600 and maybe 700 points, more or less. And if we had a really variable group of individuals, maybe the middle 68% of them would be between about 575 and 725. So the relationship between the z-scores and the raw scores is what changes. The z-scores themselves always describe whatever percentage of the normal distribution. But what that means in raw scores changes depending on what's happening in your particular distribution. So let's remind ourselves of where we're headed here. This is the kind of stuff that we do. We, we ask a problem that says, if we were to choose some particular value, an X value, for, randomly from a particular population, a normal population where we say what the mean is and the standard deviation is, then what are the probabilities? Uh, what's the probability that our value is greater than X? That, or that the probability of randomly selecting a value that is greater than a specific value in the distribution. What's the probability of selecting a value randomly that is less than a specific value in the distribution? What's the probability of selecting a value that's between two specific values in a, pro in a distribution? So we apply that to situations kind of like this, and we say if we were to choose a random chihuahua from a population of chihuahuas, the population of all chihuahuas, and let's say that it's normally distributed with a mean of 1.5 kilograms and a standard deviation of a quarter of a kilogram, 0.25 kilograms, then what are the probabilities? What's the probability of that we would randomly get ourselves a chihuahua that is over 2 kilograms in weight, or less than or equal to 1.3 kilograms in weight? Well, the probability of over 2 kilograms turns out to be about 2%. Less than 1.3 is 21%. And this has to happen that way. As soon as we've said normal and this and this, and all this stuff has to work out this way because the normal distribution kind of narrows things down. Here's the a diagram of the probability of getting a chihuahua that weighs more than two kilograms. This is the distribution. Those are the z-values in that distribution. So if we convert this into a z-score in this distribution, it has a z-score of two. That two kilograms. Um, yeah, just 0.25 kilograms is one standard deviation. So from 1.5 kilograms to a quarter of the way up is 1.75, and another quarter kilogram up is uh, 1.5. So that's a z-score of 2, and the area beyond z is just a little over 2%. And so the probability here of selecting a chihuahua that is less than 1.3 kilograms turns out to be um, the area beyond z up here is 0.788. So the area below this is 1 minus 0.788, 1 minus 0.79. So that's going to be about 21%. Wait, is that about right? About 21%. So anyway, as long as I did that math correctly in my head, which is always a bad idea. So trying to put all this stuff together, we're almost done here. This has been a long, a long lecture, longer than I prefer to give. When we find areas in the normal distribution, we have to find a z-score first, unless you're using a computer and it's software. So go to convert your raw score into a z-score, you need that z formula, this one. And the z of x, you do this, and now you have z of x. And then you use a table in your book, a table in the back of your book, or sometimes you use software, and that will tell you area. You give it the z-score, 
and it gives you some area under the normal distribution. It'll give you the area to the left of that, and then sometimes you have to sort of mentally or mathematically manipulate it to find the area that you want. And if you want to go the other way, if you happen to know a proportion or a percentage of probability of something in a normal distribution, of some portion of a normal distribution, and you want to find out what the raw score is, first you have to use the stepping stone of the z-score. And in the probability table, you just kind of use it backwards. You look in the middle of the numbers until you find your z-score, and then you, um, or you find your area, and then you look in the margins, the column and the uh, row margins, until you find what that z-score is. And then you use this formula to convert z-scores back into raw scores, so that you know what the raw score was. This is how we do things here. This, it sounds like I'm telling you, you newcomers, this is how we do things. This is how we convert raw scores into areas in the normal distribution and areas in the normal distribution back into raw scores. This is how, this is the process. So where are you going to get stuck? Not in calculating, because the calculating is easy. And looking up areas, once you do it two or three times, it's pretty easy. Where you get stuck is keeping everything straight. What's x? What's z of x? What area are you trying to find? Is it positive or negative? Am I looking, what kind of a number am I looking at? You're going to get stuck with this kind of stuff. So practice, practice, practice until it starts to make sense to you.